Pastor Stevens, Brother Mark, and Broadus, Rick, and New Holland Baptist Church, and my family. I am deeply humbled today to be honored in this way. I did not expect this, did not desire this. But it was a great blessing to me because a 30-year-old young man was called to pastor this church. Now, Baldus doesn't know and the committee didn't know anything. I used to come back and forth to the hospital two or three times a week, and I would go by this church, and I said, you know, that would be a good church to pastor someday, Lord. And I said that one day. And then I came again, and there was a real warm spot came into my heart, I promise you, two or three years before I ever even was called to this church. And the Lord would say, you know, that would be a good church, wouldn't it be a Sam? I said, yeah, I think it would. I don't know whether they'd like me or not, but but you know, time went through. I was praying. Um, you had I had a, a mutual friend that grew up here and was born here. He and Richard Waldrop were born within five minutes of each other. One was before midnight, and the other one was just after midnight in a.m. on the next day. And that was Ed Aiken. The Aiken family used to be here. I don't know, is any of those families here still? They're all gone. But Ed Aiken grew up in this this village uh, or community or maybe even a town better than Gainesville at one time. As you go back and read the history of what New Holland was, I mean, they had a indoor Olympic-sized swimming pool just down the street. Did you know that? And a, and a bowling alley and a baseball diamond. That was in the early 1900s, and there was many professional, I guess some professional, and um, almost professional men who became baseball players, and at least one from this community became the president of Coca-Cola, the CEO. And he was uh, Mr. Ivester. I can't remember his first name. Doug Ivester. But then Brother Tony and um, his father, Brother Howard, a blessing to me. I knew Howard all my life, most of the time, from the, even the childhood 60s. He was a preacher. My dad was a pastor there for a while. Great memories flood my heart. And Brother Draudus, I knew his mom and dad. He used to go to church with them, worship with them, and sing. I'd sing with a little trio, and we'd sing in their church. Great blessings. Then Brother Bradley Elliott, you know, he, he came close to me at Gillsville when he was there. But then, uh, you know, the Lord took him on somewhere else. But I remember, Brother Bradley, I had some family going to that church at that time. And, um, you know, you could take all day long. I love reunions, but there's one reunion that I'm really looking forward to, aren't you? And that is with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to be speaking just briefly in just a moment. Um, but I love reunions because it brings us together. The, and I love uh, reunions. When they asked me to come to preach, uh, uh, Brother Rick called me initially, and Brother Brian and I talked, and others, and, and brought us, uh, wanted me to preach. And he said, uh, and I said, well, I'll be praying about it. And then when he said, we're going to eat too, and I said, oh, yeah, I'll be able. The Lord just spoke to me. So, you know, a preacher is always looking for a place to eat. And, uh, you know, if you can see my belly, it's a chicken graveyard. And so uh, I grew up in that time when there was great singing. I love the music today. I love it. Brother Mark, thank you. Great memories. I love those homecomings and those reunion services because... It brought people together from everywhere. Some of you I have not seen in many years. 
And um, we sang together. And then after we'd sing, we'd go and eat. Now, I don't know where I'll, I can remember any of the preachers who preached the homecoming, what they said or not. I think I was more focused on eating and listen to the singing. So I can understand if you don't listen to me today. I can understand how that affects us. But anyway, it is good to see you, Brother Jim and Doris. It's good to see y'all. All of you, Travis Smith and, and Barbara and uh, Lord, if I start calling everybody's names out, it'll take all day long. Polly. Polly's wife, Janine, was my secretary for many, many, many years. A blessing. And uh, 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 this church was the greatest blessing that God ever gave me. And uh, I, the Lord has given me opportunities to preach uh, all over the world since I left here. It was His will I do believe in following God. I had been praying. I didn't mention this. Uh, finish it. I had been praying, God, would, what would you uh, want me to do when they contact me? And I talked to Ed Aiken, who was my closest buddy and friend. And by the way, Brother Ed died at 97 or 98 years old, just in 2000, May of 2007. He was a great soul, a great man. Um, lost both of his wives, the first one in ministry, and then he married another lady. They lived 30 years together, and then she died, and he was alone when he died, but he was a great man. Uh, he, and I went by and talked to him, and one of his famous sayings was, uh, uh, you must be one year older than Santa Claus. And he would always ask friends that, that they were older than him. And I got to use that on him when he was in the hospital. He just about a year or so before he died, I said, Ed, uh, tell me what your age is. You must be one year older than Santa Claus. And he chuckled and laughed. But then he said, Sambo, New Holland is a good church. And he said, I believe God has answered prayer and is calling you there to be the pastor. And I took this church. Lord, I didn't know what to do. This is the big church. It really was. Um, my first one was the 36-member church in Plant City, Florida. And then I went to Faith Tabernacle. We got up to about 200 uh, after in Sunday school and in worship. And when I went there, we had maybe below 100, 75 or 80. And God really blessed. And it wasn't me. It was the Lord. I always believed in praying and seeking God's direction and way in life and i do believe that yes god is great and he is the one we need to be leaning upon and i've got some things i'm going to share with you in just a moment about what we need to do in this day and hour that we live but all the years of ministry and memory of this church i made a lot of mistakes young preacher you folks forgave a young preacher of a lot of them too made some bad, uh, bad uh, decisions, let's put it that way. Uh, and, um, you know, as a young preacher, you don't realize that until later on you begin to look back and say, you know, as, uh, and you realize and see those mistakes uh, and those deficiencies that you should have been filling, uh, letting the Lord fill up your life. There was a time that God was, I, uh, God and I was real close. And then when I came here, we were close, but then we get, uh, uh, a pastor can get off course, not because he desires it, but because of the demand of ministry. Uh, there's the sick, there's the lost, there's the administration, there is the, the staff. Uh, or the lack of the staff. I told a man one time I had another church, and I said, well, I got all my staff together, and I told him, I said, well, this is the way it's going to be. And they said, well, who is your staff? I said, it's my janitor and also my secretary. So we all got three together and really talked. I really talked up big, didn't I? But anyway, you know, we need to, to rely upon the Lord. It is God who gives us the opportunity 
And it is God that sustains us to do that. And it is God that will bless us in all that we do if we trust him. And this church was a great blessing to me. And Rebecca, what could I say? And I'll not get into that because my heart still grieves on the loss of my wife. And, um, and friend, the best friend, um, mother, the best mother of our three children, of uh, Matthew and Kimberly and Gregory, and now my grandchildren and, and Angie and then Chad, Kimberly's husband, Chad Cope. I am so grateful for a godly wife. We were married almost 50 years, almost. And um, the Lord took her home. It was an atom bomb that fell into our family. Nuclear explosion. And it's hard to get over the loss of your spouse, and especially a pastor. Uh, some, I had some friends after she passed, they said, well, you can find another one. I said, really? Another? That's our society today, folks. You know, if this marriage don't work out, we can get another one. I've got, I've got some acquaintances that's been married three and four times, and, and, and the one that's been married four times is now looking for another one, and he's still got his wife. And I said, you've got to straighten up. I mean, you know, it's not something's wrong. It's not the woman. It's you. I don't think you like that. But you have to talk frank to friends. You know that? Uh, we've got a society that's got to be told and talked to frank. We almost need, and the, don't, don't quote me on this, but we almost need a dictator in this country for about four years to straighten this country and the Washington, D.C. out. We really do. We need a strong hand. We don't need no liberal or radical in Washington. Well, I'll not get on that because, you know, we can go all day long on that. <laughs> I will remember this of what Brother Adrian Rogers said, uh, and he preached to my graduation sir, uh, uh, class uh, uh, at Trinity College in Florida many years ago, 52, uh, I think it was May 13, 1972, or 14, 1972. He said, uh, if you look... In the past, you'll get sad. So we have to put the past in God's hands and say, Lord, it's yours. I, I can't do change those mistakes. I can't make any uh, corrections. I made a mess. I've done all the, and so I'm asking Calvary to cover it all. Forgive me of the past and put it in God's hands. Don't worry about the past because Adrian Rogers said it'll make you sad. And I believe that. Well, Paul said, press toward the mark. Don't put the past in the past. And then, but if you look around you, like Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Georgia, and even here in Gainesville or all around us, we'll get real mad. I don't know about you. I get real mad sometimes with these, the political agenda that's going on. And I pray for them. Lord, remove them out of the office and bring salvation to their soul and somehow. But then the third thing, and this is the thing we're going to talk about today, we're going to focus on the future. We need to, we, we can't look back because that'll make us sad. If we look around us, it's going to make us mad. But if we look up, we're going to get glad because Jesus is coming soon. We have a Father, a sovereign God in heaven, and I love those songs that you sang about the sovereignty and the greatness of God. How great is our God. And you know, uh, I, uh, over in Isaiah, and I'm going to say this just a moment, the voice said, cry, and he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. Uh, Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. 
God is great. And someday he's going to split the eastern sky. And I still look. I was in a church one time and uh, the Bible says he was preaching on the dead and Christ shall rise first. And he was going over to the window. They had blinds. They didn't have the stained glass windows. And he was looking out at the cemetery that the church had. Every little bit, he'd go over there. And he said, I guess you wonder why I'm looking out the window through the blinds. He says, the Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first. And he said, our church is dead. And I'm just thinking any time we're going to be called away. <laughs> Are you dead? I hope not. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. This is probably the greatest uh, section of Scripture regarding the purpose of a local church and its ministry and the three views that you and I should have. Um, I want us to read 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. For they themselves declare concerning what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Verse 10, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. Isn't it good that we have a great day ahead of us that Jesus is going to come soon? Do you have him in view? Now, we're living in a day in which the new world order is attempting to birth through this great reset. You know, man is doing a lot of stuff, and I'm going to cut, cut to chase. Uh, we've got a group of people in the world that's called the, the World Economic Forum, also the UN. And by the way, UN is still rejecting Israel as a nation to serve in the UN to this day. We're having all kind. All of these guys and the World Health Organization. Uh, wow. The legislature, I asked the congressman not too long ago and They've invited me to come and I'd pray and talk to those folks. And I'd said, what's going on about this World Health Organization? Do you know that we're going about, America is about, our beloved president has given over, signs an agreement last March of 2022 to sign over our health system to the World Health Organization, who is, by the way, supported by Communist China and primarily controlled by communist China. And he said, no, we've got it all fixed to defund our support of the World Health Organization. Well, I don't think that's gone through. But I'm telling you, folks, we're just almost on the threshold of a one, the new world order, a one world government, a one world banking system. You know, and you, if you read the news, you know what's going on. The one world religious system. This guy who, he's a nut, that owns Facebook is beginning a new religion. Did you know that? He's beginning, what is his name? I don't know, his, I can't remember his name. But anyhow, he's beginning a new religion. All of this new green agenda, the agenda 21, 30, 40, 50, or 1,000, or 100, is by the radicals and the World Economic Forum and the Marxist and also the wokeist or the wokeisms. I don't know. We've got too many isms. Uh, you know, Frank Geddes used to say to me, he said, Sam, part of our problems in this world is we've got too many isms. And you know, that's coming about. We've got too much. And these people say, we're the Christ. Uh, they don't say that they're the Christ, but they said, this is the answer for our future. We're going to have solar energy. We are going to get rid of the oil and all the other things and go to batteries. Now, I like Elon Musk, but I don't think he's doing the right thing because it takes more damage to the soil to produce a battery, one battery, in one of those battery-powered cars than it does to, to sustain the oil-driven automobile and transportation. But anyhow, these guys are so high up, and we have five. Did you know 
Uh, somebody pointed this out, that David had five giants, not just one, one he killed. But then the other four was gone too. There were five giants just before Israel became a nation under the kingship of King David. Did you know we now have five giant tech and media people, Google and some of those, all the way to Amazon is another, and others and others. I, I, I'm not going to go through that, but we have those five giants, and now they're trying to rule us, and they're threatening us. Uh, I had a video put on YouTube last year. It's still there. I'm holding my breath. I'm going to be putting one on pretty soon regarding the 40 days of prayer that we're going to start on September 1st. I'm trying to get, I had 200 people last year praying with us. Would you join us in that, that week? And I'll send some information to the pastor. It's a volunteer thing. It's not something that's going to upset the programs of the church because we're going to be praying. But it seems like prayer upsets the church more than anything else. I can't get, I, I can't even get churches uh, to go with me to prayer all night. Not one. I had one I tried that with and didn't try it. I said, God, I'm going to do this. And we only had three people to show up from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. the next morning. I was one. The youth pastor came. No, they were five showed up. I now remember them. The assistant chairman of deacons and then another guy who was a plumber in our church. But we can't get people to pray today. Now, the world is looking for something to change our society. And all of these entities that are saying that they can change it, and even with all the praying, there's many prayer groups, like I've just shared with you the 40 days, are praying for a supernatural awakening, a spiritual awakening. Folks, we have, it's been almost 200 years, or it has been 200 years since we've had a spiritual awakening that shook America. Did you know in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, or uh, yes, the, the, the spiritual awakening under George Whitfield and those people in the early 1700s shook this country and prepared it. It had a revival where there was thousands of people saved, and many of those men helped write the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Did you know that there was more than half men on the, that signed the Constitution were ordained preachers of God's Word? And they were also lawyers, too. But we're seeing a day in which all of that is forgotten. Let's forget the history. Let's forget, and let's tear down all the relics of, uh, of our society. And that's exactly what Mao Zedong did in, uh, in his purging China when he took over in 1949, I believe it was. That's exactly what the communists did. Lenin and Stalin removed all the relics of the past of Russia, got rid of them, and we ended up with the last czar of Russia's train in Gainesville, Georgia. It used to sit somewhere where you could see it, but that belonged to the Tsar of Russia in 19 and 18 when they were overthrown by the communists. And it ended up here, it never was delivered because of communism. So we have this Marxist today. Marxism is ruling our day. They're pushing and pulling. So what are we going to do? There are some things that we can think about, and they're wonderful. First of all, God is in control. I want you to go over uh, to Isaiah chapter 40 and read with me these verses. God is in control of these things. So what can you and I do? And it's found in this section of Scripture. God said, Behold, the nations are like a drop of a bucket. Wow. Did you know God created the nations? He did not create a global one world government. He destroyed that, you know, back in Genesis chapter 11, 10 and 11 under Nimrod. 
uh, Nimrod was the grandson of Noah. Wow. That great man? Yeah. The grandson of Noah, who was a great preacher and a great patriarch of the Bible and of faith, Noah found grace in the eyes of God, but his grandson led the first global government in the world that wanted to unite the whole people in one place instead of scattered to the four winds of the world. And God says, I don't want that. He came down and has confused them with language. I wonder sometime today why all of these people are coming from all over the world and we're confused. We can't understand them and they can't understand us. What good is that? I mean, uh, it's good to have them as neighbors, but, but God says, I want nations. Why do everybody think they've got to come to America? Or to any other nation for that matter. Are we headed toward a civil war? But God says the nations is what I wanted, but they're just like a drop in a bucket to me. Wow, you're talking about big. Whoa, the Bible says in his hand he measured out the oceans in the hollow of his hand. That's pretty big. If all the oceans can fit in his hand, the palm of his hand, that's a sovereign God. That's who we are going to see one day, folks. Can you remember that? Can you, can you just envision how great God is? But it's just like old Stuart Hamlin wrote. He said, how big is God? How big and wide his vast domain? To try to tell these lips can only start. He's big enough. To rule the mighty universe, yet small enough to live within my heart. Isn't that one? You know, there's not but one answer, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He will give us peace. He will give us joy. He will give us hope. That's what everybody's looking for today. I look out there, and I look at my savings account, and I said, boy, Lord, there ain't much hope here. A mile surviving. Somewhere down the way, there's going to be starvation. Or somebody's going to take away my things and say, I'm going to take it to pay your bills. I mean, there's not much hope, folks. So we can't look to Washington. Let's don't look to Atlanta, Georgia. I like to say that because I'm a Georgian. Georgia. And Gainesville, Georgia. Hall County. We can't look to these places to resolve our problems. In fact, they are the problem. Now, we need to get back to recognize who God is. Now, we reject Him in April, June of 1963. Madeline Mary O'Hare came on and she said, and she was a communist. Did you know that? A communist appealed to the Supreme Court and she said, I don't want my son to go and hear the Bible read to him and prayer given in a school classroom anymore because that's a violation of my personal rights. And all the judges except for one said, you know, it's about time that we need to get away from that. I got that quoted, folks, in a book that was written by none other. They said, we're going to reject. We need to get all that religion out of our schools and out of our government and and do her own thing. Well, you go back and read all the, the, the beginnings of the United States and you'll find out what a constitution is. So anyhow, those judges went ahead and did that. They rejected God. They rejected and listened to the communists for her son to keep from hearing the Bible and uh, prayers read, and so her son later on was born again and saved Southern Baptist preacher. Can you believe that? I'm glad he was a Southern Baptist because I'm one too. Now, I don't believe everything about Southern Baptists. And also, don't permit everything to the Southern Baptists because they'll do it. that's just a convention. This is the church. Southern Baptist Convention has no power over us. It can suggest that these, if you want to be a membership, it's a membership of churches. So this church here 
is the greatest church in this community and in this city, I think. But God, but anyhow, her son was born again and wrote a book, Let Us Pray. That was Madeline Mary O'Hare's son that she was appealing to the Supreme Court not to have the Bible read. You know, God will save us. He wants to save everybody. And He has a way to get through to everybody on earth with His gospel plan. And no legislation, no Supreme Court, no president or king can stop His hand. That's how big God is. Aren't you glad that we serve a living and true God? That's what the Bible says here, that they turned, what? They turned from idol, turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. We have a living and true God. He's not dead. Now, our music may be dead. Our preaching may be dead. And that's because we don't spend, spend time before Him in prayer and say, Lord, would you take what we have? I told the Lord this morning, I said, I, I've got a mess. I've been pre Did you know how long I've been working on this message? For over a month. About a month now. And then I've been working and reading, and, and, but I've learned a whole lot more about God's Word. A whole lot more. That's what God wanted to do. You see, He puts us in crisis sometimes so that we can learn more about Him and trust Him more to get through our lives. That's why we're in crisis. But we have a living, true God. And so I told the Lord this morning, I said, I got a mess. I'm going to give it back to you. And you help me preach it. So you say, this preacher don't know what he's doing. That's exactly right. <laughs> if you put your confidence in a preacher, and I've had a lot of folks says, and I said, you better be careful. Because just because a preacher is a preacher and he preaches a good message, don't make him God. God is above us all. And the Bible says... In verse 15 again, verse 17 of Isaiah 40, and I'm going to hurry. All nations before him are as what? Nothing. America is nothing. Folks, if it goes down tomorrow, God's still on his throne. Amen? I mean, really, probably we need to allow God to just let it all fall and let him pick up the pieces and put them together again because we trust. Are you praying that God, if whatever happens, are you, going, are you praying that God will put the things together in your life and in this country for help us to be surviving until Jesus comes again? Did you know we are living in the most exciting day to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and the joy of the Lord? Because there's so many people without hope. So many people today are without the hope of Jesus Christ. And then in verse 21 in Isaiah 40, Have you not known, have you not heard how big God is? That's what I'm saying. Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? There were foundations of the earth. They did not evolve, and it's not more than 150 billion years or even 10,000. There's only 6,000 years of written history of man on this earth. Verse 22, it is He, listen to what God, it says about God. It is God who sits upon the circle of the earth. Now what in the world happened to the Middle Ages that they believed the earth was flat? They didn't know what God's Word said. The Bible says the earth was a circle. And that was, oh Lord, how long was that before the Lord Jesus Christ came in here? That was about six, seven hundred years before Jesus came into the world and that God revealed Himself that this was written. And now it's been 2,023 years since the Lord's life lived on the earth. So that's been more than tw almost 3,000 years since that scripture has been written down by the prophet Isaiah. He said, the inhabitants, 
the inhabitants, therefore, now you and I, this is who we are, the inhabitants in verse 22. God sits upon the circle of the earth. Aren't you glad somebody's outside the earth looking in and saying, mm, that's bad and you're going to get it and you're going to get it and you're going to get it if you don't straighten up. If you don't turn to the Lord's love and grace, you're going to get it. The day is coming. It's an awful eternity to reject God and live for God all your live for the way you want to live all your life on earth and then die and head into an awful eternity without God's presence. I do not want to even think about that. But there's a many souls in hell today. But notice it said the inhabitants thereof are like grasshoppers. Oh, you're a grasshopper. We're like one. Well, I can see that because I've pastored all these years and I can't keep people together with me under my preaching. They hop around here and hop around there and hop around over here and over there. I still see people. I said, are y'all still going to certain, certain church? No, and I'm not talking about uh, uh, staying there for years. I'm talking about frequently, you know. They just go from one church to another to hear this preacher. Oh, we're going over seeing Reverend so-and-so today or Pastor so-and-so. Or now we're going to see Sister so-and-so that's going to be... T oh, she's marvelous. <laughs> and the Southern Baptist says, just said, No, they are wonderful, but they are not pastors. And... They may be teachers. I really believe God wanted a husband and wife to be a companion in ministry. The pastor and the wife was under the, under the authority of God's authority and design of submitting to the pastor or to her husband. But the wife was one whom the, the husband and the pastor submitted to in their love toward each other and giving them honor and they could teach the women of the church. Now, I do believe that. I think that will comfortably fit in with the Southern Baptists because if we don't, if that doesn't, Brother Brian, Pastor Brian, we'd have to remove Lottie Moon and Annie Armstrong from our offering because they were both women. Ah, mm. God's work is much bigger than the Southern Baptists ever thought or the Catholic, or the Presbyterians. But all of us think that we're the only ones. But when we get to heaven, there's not going to be but one group there. In Ephesians chapter 4, it tells us that one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one spirit, one Father of all who is above all. One. We're going to be one. That ugly neighbor that you have over there sitting beside you today is going to be one with them, if, even if you don't like them. If they're a born-again Christian, we've got to become one. The church needs to become united in their faith together under God's superiority. And God says this in verse 23, God will bring the princes to nothing. Oh, please, God, that includes the, the, the political leaders of the world, folks. He maketh the judges of the earth his vanity. I told a group not long ago, I said, folks, it's not going to be Republicans. It's not, uh, they asked me to come to pray. I don't know why they just want me to come to pray, but I end up preaching. We can be Republicans. We can be a Democrat, independent, libertarian, or whatever you think you are in the wokeism crowd. Sometimes I do feel like a grasshopper. So I won't be a grasshopper today. We may think it doesn't matter. God is above all of these, and He will put things in order. Now let's look at the Scripture I've spent too long on the introduction, but I won't preach that long, I promise you. The Word of God is here. God is a great God. And so Paul said, and from you, in verse 8, in uh, 
1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verse 8, from you, these three things, from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. I'm going to say this. First of all, we need to draw near to God and our faith in God must be real. Um, our God is a mighty God and we must focus on God faithfully. Where is your faith? Jesus exhorted his disciples when he came through and cursed a fig tree, and the next day they found out that it had dried up, and they said, Lord, look there. Can you believe that? That's dried up. Well, all the way through the Scriptures, there were people who doubted their own prayer. They were praying it, but they doubted God would, oh, we're just going to be praying. Some of you are praying those things. It's all in vain. God's not hearing us. Well, you need to ask him, why aren't you hearing me, Lord, and listening to me? I've asked the Lord that many times, and man, he comes up with some things that I didn't even think about. Why he had not answered me. You can't get every prayer answered. If you did, you'd probably be in hell today. Or in a bigger mess than that, and how worse can that be? But Jesus said, he turned to his disciples and he said, let me tell you something. Have faith in God. Do you have faith in God? I had a lady one time, I was out here at Lanier Village Estates teaching the Bible and she came up and, and she said, uh, I'm, and she shared with me and I said, well, we'll pray with you about it and you need to seek the Lord. She said, I just don't believe in praying. No, I just don't waste my time praying. I said, are you a believer? Are you born again? Yes, but I, I just don't believe in praying. Well, I said, how in the world could you have gotten saved if you couldn't pray and didn't pray? We need to have faith in God. How strong is your faith today? Let me show a verse of Scripture to you. In Galatians chapter 2, 20, it says this word, and I'm, I'm just going to quote it. I hope I'm going to quote it, Brother Mark. I was going to, and I've quoted that many times, so you know. Y'all forgive me, I'm just getting old. It's good to use that excuse now. <laughs> See, you say, well, I'm just getting old, I'm sorry. You can't, get used, you can't get by with that until you get older. Verse 20 of chapter 2, I am co-crucified with Christ, Paul said. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by what? The faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. How much faith do you have? If you're a Christian, you have the faith of Jesus Christ. It's not how much, it's who. See, we Christians and, and Americans especially, we want, to quanti we want to find out how much quantity we have, how much food, how much money, how much possessions. In the kingdom of God, it's totally taken care of and it's all our faith in Him. He, listen, Jesus Christ has accomplished all of redemption and salvation by the sacrifice of Himself on the cross through His death and burial and through His resurrection. He's accomplished it, folks. You don't have to do a thing except trust Him and believe Him. Have faith in God. How simple in a relationship can you be? You don't have to get into arguments saying, well, I'm just torn up with God today. He's, he's left me and forgot all about me. No. If he thinks you're a grasshopper, then he hadn't forgotten you. Really? And the Bible says he even knows the sparrow and feeds the sparrow. 
I see some of those animals walking in my backyard in the woods. Deer is everywhere. Those deer hunters, if you want to come and hunt my yard, you can come and get them because I've got hundreds coming out of the woods. But those little insects and little birds and things, God feeds them. So if God can feed the little bird, the sparrow, how much more will he do that? In chapter 6 and chapter 7, of Matthew, he says, Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. And somebody said, Well, I've asked the Lord a long time ago. Why hasn't God answered me? I said, Well, you need to ask Him. Why and what's going on, Lord? No, you don't do it in an attitude of arrogance and pride, but in submission and a humility. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. That is the hope that we have in America. That's the hope that you have in your family. That's the hope that you have as an individual for all time and eternity. Did you know that Solomon never prayed that prayer when God said, if you get in trouble, if you have a, a pestilence and all those things in chapter, uh, 2 Chronicles 7, uh, 12, 13, and then 14, then pray this prayer. Solomon, King Solomon never prayed that prayer. I don't think, I think there was two or three kings. Uh, Jehoshaphat turned his eyes toward God when the Philistines were surrounding him or the enemies were coming around him. God is our faith. The Lord Jesus Christ has already accomplished it all. And the Bible says that these people sounded out the word of God because they believed God's word was God's word. This Bible, how much do you read of it? I've heard people say, well, I just can't understand the thing that preacher's talking about. Well, do you read the Bible? Maybe if you read it, you'd understand and familiar what Brother Brian's talking about. It's time for that. Let me go on. Secondly, we're not only to focus on God's faithfulness. And did you know in Habakkuk 2, 4, the just shall live by faith. In Galatians 3, 11, the just shall live by faith. Romans 1.17, the just shall live by faith. Hebrews 10.38, the just shall live by faith. We are to live by faith. Who is our faith? Oh, come on. Now, y'all know that. Who is our faith? That's a little better. You wouldn't be good at a football game. Now, I want to hear a strong word and name Jesus, all right? And what is our, and who is our faith? Jesus. Jesus. Ah, that's better. Now, that got the attention of the Lord then. All right, secondly, we are to live victoriously through Jesus Christ, the Lord who gave us the Holy Spirit. Notice what he said here. They turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. The Bible says that Christ is our victory. Did you know in Revelation 4 verse 11, it gives us that the kingdom of God is great and wonderful and powerful. Jesus said in John, in John 16 verse 33, and I love this verse. John 16, verse 33, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. Do you want peace? You find it in Jesus. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28, and 29, and 30. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Rest is peace in our souls and minds and spirits. And this is what Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation. We're having tribulation today more than we can even name. I can't even begin to name all that you and I are going through. They're even threatening to take away the dollar bill and replacing it with a, some kind of a Bitcoin with gold backing. I don't know what's going on. That's set to happen in just a few months. 
in America. But Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He is our victory, folks. Jesus is our victory. 1 John 5, 4, this word is sown. This is what the Bible says. Uh, and this is the, uh, let's see. Well, let's go over to chapter 1 John 4, 5, 4. Pardon me for not being able to quote that right now. I've preached on that again many times. You're so forgiving. Thank you for forgiving and being patient with me. I'm almost finished. Verse 4 of 1 John 5. It's better for you to read it anyhow than me to quote it. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Hmm. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our Faith. Now, who is our faith? Jesus. Amen. Wow. Jesus is everything. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, Jesus, it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God in your prayer is a rewarder and believes him is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Psalm 105, verse 4, it says, Seek the Lord, seek His strength, seek His face forevermore. The face. I've got a bulldog at home. Every morning he wants to look at me straight in the face and say, That's what the Lord wants. He wants us to kiss Him every morning. Do you kiss the Lord often? Now, I know you're kissing your, your husband or wife or your sweetheart, but do we kiss the Lord? That means seeking His face. I want to see you in the face. I don't like these folks that look this way. Preacher, I come and I want to talk to you about my problem. And they look all the way around the bush and everything and they never look at you in your eye. Why? Be honest. If you've got honest problems, honestly you have problems, be honest with God and go to Him in His face and seek Him in faith and in prayer. So the face of God is the most wonderful face that you'll ever look at. When you get to heaven, you're going to find out, folks. I, I don't even have the slightest idea of what He looks like. I don't even know how the slightest, what heaven is about. I don't even know what, how big God is and even the universe. It is so big, sight to say today that the universe is continually getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And that means that God must be making room for more of us to get there. So that's what we need to be doing, is sounding out the word of faith. The Lord Jesus Christ is our Savior and believing God who is our faith, who is our victory to a lost world without hope, without salvation, and headed to a devil's hell. That's what you and I have the answer. Did you know New, Hol New Holland Baptist Church needs to buy an ad this week? Now, I'm not going to put that on Brother Brian's. If you got the money, you need to buy an ad in the newspaper or on the media and say, New Holland Baptist Church has the answer for America. It's problems. Jesus. You said, no, I had a lady one time, and I was a, serving as a North American missionary, uh, mission board uh, chaplain in a state prison. And the warden called me in. He said, Sam, he said, I, our chaplain, he said, I want you to speak to officer so-and-so and because I've just had to terminate her or just she just wasn't working out. And that lady, I went in there and I said, tell me about it. And she was in tears and trouble and everything. And, 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 and you know, in, in, in a secular world, that you, you're dealing with people, you have to let them answer their own question. And so I didn't go in there with my Bible and say, bless God, you're going to hell unless you repent. 
You don't do that. You go in there and let them talk. Then you listen. And you should already be in touch with God that as Nehemiah prayed, he sent up a prayer real fast when the king asked him, being the cupbearer, what do you want me to do, Lord? And the Lord sent him the message back. And he answered the king. So that lady, I, I let her talk. And, and I said, ma'am, have where is your thoughts about God? Do you, do you have God as your father? Do you have faith in Jesus? Or what is your faith? In. And she says, I want more substance. I'm wanting substance. I don't need religion. I want substance and I need some money. I am lost my job and I don't know what I'm going to do. And I said, well, silver and gold have I not, but such as I have, give I unto you. Take up your bed and walk in the name of Jesus Christ. I pointed her to that. I don't know where she took that or not. But that is the answer to all of our problems, folks. All of them. I don't care what problem you have. It is all the problems. He has the answer. And then lastly, these believers had God in their focus of worship. They destroyed their idols. You know, what kind of idol? You know, that can be a hindrance. Idols is, well, I'll say this. Jesus answered John the Divine, First John 2, verse 15 and 17, he says, love not the world. That's our idol, folks, this world. I worked as senior, with senior adult uh, and retiree people before in uh, a senior adult facility, not uh, a retirement center, and I've heard them, they're, they're so wealthy. I mean, millionaires, multimillionaires. I've got a friend that was worth $40 million in 2008, and he lost every bit of it. And he lives here in Gainesville, and he's still my friend. He's no longer $40 million. And I'm going to tell you, it can go tomorrow. These people in this retirement home was holding on to their wealth and their position and their status, and they didn't want to lose it. And I would tell them, I said, Jesus is the Christ. He is the Savior, and He is the answer. Jesus is the answer for all. And so, love not the world, nor the things that are in the world, idols, which are the love of uh, all the things that are in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Three enemies is the world, the flesh, and the devil. The very flesh I have is an enemy, can be an enemy to me. It's taken a lot of folks off on a wild goose chase. They come back and say, man, I have lost. I don't know what in the world I did that for. And the devil is always working, folks. I'm going to tell you, before you got up this morning, the devil had an angel, or he, he wasn't there, but he sent one of his emissaries, demonic emissaries, to when you got out of bed to trip you and make you fall and break your neck if it had not been for an almighty God to catch you, one of his angels, you would be. You can be gone just like that, folks. You need to get rid of the idols. Love not the world. Because he who loves the world will pass away. But he that doeth the will of God abides forever. Now, I want, I want, I want to tell you, what this is the right. Now, that's your left side. This is your right side. I want to be on the right side with God. Not on the left side. And even though I'm a left-hander, I don't want to be on the left side with the devil. He is the answer to our problems, no matter what. No matter what our mistakes are. Remember, forget the past. Put them in the hands of our Heavenly Father at the cross. Or it'll make you sad. It'll worry you to death. 
And sure don't look around the circumstances today because I'm going to tell you, every time I turn on the TV and watch the news, I get depressed. I don't know, I get real aggravated and I really get snappy with my bulldog. And if there was somebody else, if Greg was around, I'd get snappy with him. We better look up. And that's what the Bible says. Look, in closing, in first, verse 10, and we're to wait for God's Son, Jesus, from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. Did you know there's a tribulation coming? A period of great tribulation. And that's going to happen someday. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58 tells us, but now is Christ risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have died. So I know that Rebecca, and if I'm there in the ground, we're all going to raise first and go up together. Won't that be wonderful? Won't that will be a reunion? That's going to be the joy of that. We're to keep our eye on the one who is coming back to raise our families, and our loved ones from the dead, and to take us who are still living at that time and transform us, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18, to transform us and catch us all in the air to be with Jesus forevermore. Until Revelation 19, when He comes again as Messiah, King of kings and Lord of lords, and he destroys the armies of the devil and of the wicked on earth in chapter 19 of Revelation at the Battle of Armageddon. And then in chapter 20, the Bible says he arrests the devil and puts him in the bottomless pit for 1,000 years. And guess what happens after then? The church, the body of Christ, the bride of Jesus and Jesus will have a honeymoon together 1,000 years. That's a long honeymoon, folks. But it's going to be wonderful. Read Isaiah chapter 40 all the way through and you'll find out that it talks about the king. Ezekiel chapter 40 is another. Read that. It shows what's going to be. All the way through the Old Testament, it tells us what that millennial kingdom will be. The baby will play on the hole of a snake. A poisonous snake. Ah! The lion will lay down with the lamb. And the Bible says we'll study no war no more. Praise God for that. How many wars have we had? I don't want to count them in just the last 100 years. But the day is coming that the Lord said, I'm going to take your swords and make them into plowshares. <gasps> you mean to tell me we're all going to go back to farming again? According to the Bible, everybody will have their own farm land and they will have their own vegetables to plant. Read it. It's in the scripture in Isaiah. We're going to be farmers. Somebody said, I object. I do not want to be on the farm. I'm going to go to the city. Well, go and live in Jerusalem if you want to. You know, they're fighting in just about on the part of a civil war right now. All over the world, there's violence, there's stress, there's tension. But Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Do you know Him today? Have you trust Him? Will you trust Him? 